Anybody ever heard the word, the name, Admiral Yotomoto? Okay, he was the leading admiral in World War II. He'd lived in the United States, gone to Harvard, traveled the United States, warned the, told them not to do it, told them not to the point, to do it not to the point that a group of the military um, higher brass in Japan decided to assassinate him. But they couldn't get to him because he was on a war, he was on a ship. But he said, you do not want to start a war in China or with the United States. He says, they may look placid, but you do not want to wake the giant. I feel it's time the church rise up as the giant that we are in Jesus Christ and begin to push back. I believe we need to, as influence, begin to understand what God has called us to. Passengers aboard a luxury cruise ship were having just a phenomenal time. It was just beautiful weather, beautiful ship that was traveling. And most people are outside and all of a sudden this little girl fell over. Immediately, an 80-year-old man dove into the water and he rescued her. The crew pulled them out of the shark-infested waters. The captain was, great, was grateful as well as amazed that a white-haired old man formed such an act of bravery and heroism. That night, they decided to have a large banquet given in honor of the ship's elderly hero. He was called forward to receive an award and everybody's applause. He was asked, uh, would you say a few words? I said, yes. First, I'd like to know who pushed me overboard. <laughs> Sometimes we need to get pushed. But no worry, I'm going to pray that uh, this is going to be a good kind of push this morning. Because I've been praying and asking the Holy Spirit to push us, bump us, poke us, to become to be the people that God has designed us to be. Everyone in this room is a minister. Everyone in this room has a valid ministry. Everyone in this room will give an account before God of how we're doing. I believe it's time that we stop being silent. There's a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. I think the reality is we've been poked enough, we've been silent enough, we've been intimidated enough that we now need a little gentle push from the Holy Spirit to begin to realize it's time to break our silence. Therefore, Here, just, just in reading this verse reminds me of what's going on in our society. I got a, a text from, uh, I subscribed to this preaching thing, and it, it says, you are never to use him or her, male or female, and you're just them. Now, the verse says to him, now, I know it means to all people, okay, I understand that. James 4 17 therefore to him who knows how to do good who knows to do good and does not do it to him it is sin and LT says remember it is sin to know what you ought to be doing and not to do it ESV says so whether knows the whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him it is sin I believe there's a time for the church to speak up first we're gonna pray up that's a given I often, I, when, I, when I talk about it, well, we got to pray for it. We've been praying all along. Prayer without works. Faith without works. Dead. Show me faith, I'll show you my faith from the work, or what God's called me to do. Christianity got taken out of our U.S. government, and the church has stood by in silence. Absolutely, unbelievably lies that are being spoken 
by supposedly intelligent people. Separation of church and state. Nowhere. Nowhere. But you're going to hear college professors go, oh yeah, I've got that, that wall. There's no wall. A couple, I'll, I'll redo my whole series on the Constitution and Christianity, the founding of our nation. But we took it in silence. We might have whimpered here and there, but it's time we stand up and say no. Three times the Supreme Court of the United States has declared that this is a Christian nation. The Bible got taken out of the U.S. courtrooms and the church stood by in silence. You realize that we now have two, three women in Congress who took their oath of office on the Koran. Koran's real clear. You can lie and cheat and do anything you got to do to defeat the infidels. It's time we get back to it. But in court, you don't have to swear to God or anything else. You've got to affirm. By the way, the thing now is, uh, if you want to vote in Colorado, all you've got to do is affirm you're a U.S. citizen. Bible reading in public schools got banned and the church stood by in silence. This is an interesting one because I was participating in a pretty good uh, skirmish when my kids were in high school and uh, the Bible club was going to get kicked out. <laughs> I don't think so. The church has got to stand up. To know to do right and to fail to do it, it's, your, it's sin. Public prayer in schools were stopped. Church stood by in silence. Freedom of speech allows people to speak nasty, profane things in public, even openly acknowledging speaking lies. And the church stands by in silence. Abortion laws killing millions of innocent babies. Now we've even degraded to the point of infanticide. Now I know we haven't been silent, but we haven't been speaking up enough. Satan, through the demonic spirits of fear, intimidation, and silence, has silenced all too many within the fellowship of the saints of God. I believe God has called the church to time to break his life. I'm not talking about getting Molotov cocktails and lead pipes. I'm talking about we pray and then we stand up. And then we speak up. Because we know it's wrong. Amen? We know it's wrong. But we continue to be silent. For God has not given us the spirit of fear and of timidity, intimidation, but of power and love and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. I think it's time for some of us to break out of our comfort zones. And speak up. Ephesians 5.11, which by the way is in the imperative mood when it's written. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Oh, we can't do that. We're not to judge them, we're just to expose them. That's the, 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 the church doesn't understand. They need to be brought to the light of Jesus Christ. There needs to be a light put on them. If they hide. We don't know how we're going to do it. Zachariah, in, in his book, he was just, what are we going to do? I mean, you're going to make the mountains, they're going to turn them into plains. All these things you're saying is going to happen. And so he answered and he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We begin with prayer. We're filled with the Spirit. We know which ones we need to take on because the Holy Spirit's going to tell us. And then we're going to move forward. Now, you always run into this with the idea that, well, I'm timid. God has not given you a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and a sound mind. 
That means you can pray and you can support. You don't have to go out and, and lift up a placard. I told you that, you know, I wanted to go down to Eugene for Women's Day and march for the unborn women that wanted life. They didn't let me. Where's the time? First in prayer to the host, the, the Lord of hosts. Then we need to begin to participate. Three weeks ago, we talked about salt and light. Neither one of them are any good. You don't put salt under a, you don't put a light under a bushel, but it shows the way. It exposes. And salt's no good unless you mix it up. It's absolutely no good unless you mix it up. Unless it becomes part of what you're trying to do. Speaking up. Luke 19. Um, Oh, see, this is why my brain doesn't work like it should sometimes. Anybody know what next week is? Okay, it's good. You're all going to be early for church. It's time change. <laughs> yeah, time change next week. It's, it's spring forward, fall back. So if you show up at uh, 10 o'clock, your normal time for, for church... Uh, when it's really 9 o'clock, I'm not doing the sermon twice. <laughs> but anyway, it, it's next week. I, I don't know why. Why I didn't see that, and I thought, oh, remind him next week is uh, okay. Triumphal entry. That's what got me off on that. Because we look at the triumphal entry in Luke, the 19th chapter, and, and Hosanna to the king. The promises of God are coming true. All these promises, and the Pharisees, and the, the people in authority, and the social hey shut them up rebuke your disciples rebuke the people for crying out to God and praising God the things are going to happen I got to tell you Jesus is here and he's now and Jesus tells them look I can tell you if, I can tell them to keep quiet if they keep quiet then the stones are going to cry out there's a time to speak up we often refer that well we're just you know we got to praise God no it's a time to speak up the stones are going to cry out the promises of God Messiah is on the way Messiah is here Praises to God, the glory of God. The, the, the things that God had promised with the coming of the Messiah was happening. Jesus is here. It's time to break our silence. I think breaking out of silence allows truth to come into our community. Amen? Uh, and again, we're not doing it arrogantly. We're not doing it boastfully. We're not doing it anything but lovingly. When you know to do right, to be good, and you don't do it, you fail to do it, you just sin. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Isn't it? Or is that only tough for me? I, I, I get, man, there's times that I don't want to... The Lord says, no, this is what you're going to do. And again, I'm not saying we're all going to pick up placards and hit people over the head with them. But we're going to start with prayer, and then for those that God calls to it, we're going to, we're going to go to places and make a difference. It's time to break our silence and bring truth to our communities. Amen? Ta second, by breaking our silence, it's breaking our silence for our children and grandchildren. The children's good. It takes a village to raise a child, she said. I don't want her and my kids in your village. You know, the government. I mean, how many times in the last couple of years have we seen where they think that the government knows better? They're going to indoctrinate. They're going to manipulate. They're going to do all these things, not tell the parents. And then when the parents want to get involved... California is running through the thing of if you don't approve or you don't agree, you don't let for your child to have the drugs that will alter them forever, the state will take away your kid. By the way, by the way, just let me tell you something from experience. When kids leave the home and they get under the government's thing, even if they want to, I had a kid one time that decided to leave home and, and uh, go on government assistance. 
She did. They gave her money. Money for her and the baby, though she was living with the baby's dad with his parents. And cops said, can't touch her, can't go anywhere around her. No, 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 no. She was 16, got a baby, blah, 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 blah. I said, I can't do a thing about it. No. no. So the government's taking responsibility. Well, yeah. <laughs> Except they sent me a $10,000 bill for the assistance that she got through the government. The state of Alaska. They, by the way, by the way, there were six other sets of parents and myself that got that law changed. We had to go to the state assembly. But it's time to speak up. See, if nobody had spoken up, all those kids that ran away, all those kids, they went one, one group of kids, five, 16, knew what to do, ran away. They got two, three thousand dollars each a month, moved into one house together, and parents paid the bills, but they couldn't touch it. It wasn't until somebody spoke up. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not paying. It. By the way, in the state of Alaska, you don't have a choice. Because they keep your permanent fund. You, you know, permanent fund is a check that we get every year from the state for our oil and land leases. Um, and when we don't have crooked governments, the checks are pretty good. But, well, well, I better stop. I'm getting lazy. But, uh, but it's time we speak up for our children. Train up the child in the way they should go. When they're old, they're not depart from it. They'll, they'll always know it. Leviticus 10, 11, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. Teach them when it is clean and what things are unclean. How dare you do that? How dare you teach them the things that are unclean? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget all the things your eyes have seen unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. We're talking about the, the ways of the Lord. And they shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you sit down and when you rise up. 1 Timothy 1.3, I urged you when I, when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they may teach no other doctrine. The great problem they were running into right then was Gnosticism. Gnosticism, of course, you know, Gnosticism is knowledge. And knowledge is, is everything. Gnosticism taught that, um, you know, we're all spirit. And, and they'd take and rework some spirit verses. And so whatever you did with your body was cool. Because it wasn't a sin. So you do anything you wanted with your body. It didn't, there, there were no moral values because the body didn't have any significance or eternal thing. And, and that was flying up until about the third century. By the way, it's re-emerged in this century. It re-emerged earlier. Can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Okay, that ages some of you and tells me some of your uh, music habits in the 60s. <laughs> For others, just let it go. <laughs> but the reality is that, again, we're at a position where people who think they know better than the Word of God are trying to turn the teachings, the truth, the health, what gives us stability in the Word of God, from the Word of God to their, in my in the Bible's word, pervertedness. We, we need to understand that that it is a perversion. I I, uh, I need to, I need to see that that our society, especially concerning our children and our grandchildren and great grandchildren, and not just that, children in general. I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. 
the doctrine that says I can determine my own gender is a doctrine of self-rule. But again, here's the thing, folks. Don't think this just blew up out of nowhere. You've got the Old Testament that says, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I'm God. I'll make the decisions. I'll decide what's right and wrong. I'll decide what I want to be because I feelings tell me what I need to be. And every time, and it appears a number of times in the Old Testament, and everyone did what was right in their old eyes, disaster struck. Hundred and ten times in the Bible, hundred and seven verses it talks about teaching. The majority of them are teaching the children, the drawing children, teaching them the truth and the words of God. They're just not moral guidelines. They're they're words of life to bring them to health, to bring them to hope. I I, uh, I really bristle. And I hope it's a righteous bristle. When I hear governments think that they have the right to our children. You have no rights to my child or my grandchildren. I will stand before God. A great grandchildren. Are you praying for them? Are you writing their, they're writing their names down and praying for them? Are you getting involved in making sure that they're, that they're hearing the Word of God? Most of you understand I was just the worst person in, I was every high school, junior high school teacher's name. August, let me see the history books. Let me see your social science books. Go home, go to the Bible, and go to historical books. This one doesn't work this day. Well, why do you know? Because this guy's selling books to make money. And by the way, I, I have done that all the way from the 80s till 2008 or 9, wherever it was when Hannah graduated. And it got more blatant, I, I, I will admit, outside of James helping me when he had a civics class, he'd bring some papers in some years back. I have not looked at a, at a high school book since then. But I was amazed how as time went on, their lives became more and more and more blatant. Just absolutely blatant. And if the church doesn't speak up, if the church doesn't say that's not true, to know to do right and not to do it, to let a, to let a lie slide doesn't help anybody. It doesn't mean we've got to be mean and obnoxious. It means we need to be informed and prayed up. And have the power, the spirit, that God has given us a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind, self-discipline. I, I believe this is the time there's Carol is going to have a, a Carol Lowry is going to have some information and some stuff next week. There's a march um, in a few weeks at our Capitol. And uh, it's a march for choice. Well, choice for schools. How wrong is that? How wrong is, and, and I'm for one, I'm, I just, I'm irritated the more I, and, I'm, and I hope it's righteously irritated. When I hear they're doing worse and worse things to our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. But God help us to speak up. Help us not to be silent in the face of evil. Thirdly, we need to break our societal, it's for our society's sake. We already talked about all the things that we stayed silent. It's time the church to stand up. It's time we begin to pray first. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, to pronounce the guilty of the innocent for a payoff. They ignore the just cause of the innocent. Is Exodus. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. Ever heard of Eli the prophet? Him and his family were chosen by God to be priests. 
He had a little man called Samuel as a boy. Eli's son abused their positions. They used their positions. They mocked God by what they did. And God tells Eli very clearly why he destroyed his entire family. He said, I chose you in your family to be priests. But his sons did not walk in his ways, and they turned aside after dishonest gain. They took bribes, and they perverted justice. The next verses will talk about immoral sex stuff. Proverbs 17, a wicked person accepts a bribe behind the back to pervert the ways of justice. The king establishes the land by justice, but he who receives bribes overruns it. Who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away justice from the righteous. These are all the word of God against people. No one calls. By the way, we think Isaiah is just this prophet running around. Isaiah was high born, high class born, and all these things. Isaiah is not out on the street. Isaiah is pointing to the king. Isaiah is pointing to counselors. Listen, guys, this is what God's got against you. Amos was, was a sheep herder. He, he was out in the lower lands at the same time. Isaiah went right into the palace. Right, Isaiah spoke their language. He knew what they were about, and he went right at them. It's time we in the church speak right at it. It's wrong. But we're silent. And that is not a good thing for our nation. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and they speak lies. They convince evil and bring forth iniquity. There is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes them that way shall not know peace. Proverbs 20.10 False ways and unequal measures. The Lord detests. Enter, I, I won't go into it. We went into a couple of weeks ago. Detests double standards of every kind. If we don't speak up, who's going to speak up? First, there's prayer. And then we speak up. If you don't know your school board members' names and numbers, you need to get them. If you don't know your congressman's names, your senator's names, your governor, governor's names, whatever, we need to speak up. Isaiah just said, went right to him. What's wrong with the church? Well, we don't want to get involved. We don't have a right to get involved. We are going to be held accountable before God to know the right and not to do it to human descent. We need to speak up. We don't have to threaten but we need to know the Word of God enough to be able to call and say, this is wrong. This is wrong. And I don't agree. Now, some like me will say, you vote for this thing, and I'll do everything I can to get you out of office. By the way, even somebody stood before David and you, you did this. If we're, and we're in a better position, I don't want to say that. Yeah, well, I did. We're in a better position because we can elect our officials. They represent us. Crack in the White House. I won't even, stop, Greg. But I'll tell you, that, that doesn't represent what it means to walk in relationship with Jesus Christ. But we need to pray first, and then we need to stand up. I think by breaking our silence, we can do a lot to save our society. We're not better than God is. I, I, I have Romans here. Um, all of you, I'm sure, have read Romans, the first chapter, the end of the first chapters of Romans. The, um, I'll just give it a little bit. Of it. You, you understand that the downward spiral of man, Romans, the first chapter, starts in about oh, 25 or so, 
they deliberately forfeited the truth of God and accepted a lie, paying homage and giving service to the creature instead of the Creator. By the way, think about what each one of these things. They give they give homage to the creature instead of the Creator. Ellie spent sixty million bucks starting on a freeway and got it partially going, and they had to stop. Why? Because they were moving into grounds where a rat, a kangaroo rat, tested on the sidewalks. Don't talk to California about water or lack of water. They let it go into the ocean because they got these little tiny fish, or whatever they are. But if they let it go into the fields as God intended, whatever they are, could, could. Remember, it's could be. It's never will be. It could be. And by the way, they're animals. And I hate to tell it to you. But man is above animals. And we need to love people. We don't disabuse animals. We don't do that. But I'm telling you, we become a nation that some of the stuff we do is insanity. When the Word of God says they, they forfeited the truth of God, they deliberately forfeited the truth of God. We're just going to throw it out and accept a lie. They pay homage and give service to the creature instead of the Creator, who is worthy to be worshipped forever and ever. Amen. God, therefore, handed them over to their disgraceful passions and, and that goes all the way through there. It winds up a number of verses later saying, and they do more than this, being fully aware of God's pronouncement, all those who do these things deserve to die. They not only continued their own practices, but they did not hesitate to give a thorough approval of others who did the same. One translated said, they voted, a vote of confidence, the ones, and read the end of Romans, you can see what they're talking about. But the reality is, when is the church going to stand up and say, no, that's wrong, that's a lie. If we want a society, then first, by the way, wait, wait, wait. first, we need to live with integrity, personally. That's where it starts. Then, we pray and then we say, no, that's not right. My kid will not be involved in that. Any of you held out of school um, participation in school events because your parents wrote a note I was I couldn't go to square dancing because Christians don't dance so they had square dancing and I got to go to study hall and work something's wrong with that picture right there I didn't see square dancing as uh, something that we can't do. But I understood their intent. You know, they don't want to get near the edge. But I, I, uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about open things the Bible says no. I believe our society is in need of someone to stand up. Someone's. And just say that's not right. We see what it's said through the word. False weights. Unusual measures. The Lord detests double standards. Dietrich Kahn Bonhoeffer, who paid with his life. Three weeks before the war's end, he was hung, naked, on a meat hook. He had protested against Nazism in Germany. He came to the United States to speak. He had been here before. And they urged him and urged him and urged him not to go back to Germany. He was a German citizen. He did. Went to concentration camp, and three weeks before World War II was over, they hung him naked on a meat truck. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act. Is to that. Erwin Martin Luther King Jr. said, There comes a time when silence 
to his betrayal. I believe the church needs to recognize there are areas, especially as the Holy Spirit, we, we love the Lord, we're guided by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean we get, but we pray, and then when the Holy Spirit says, I want you to speak to that, I want you to do something about that, then we need to be doing that. Amen? Rabbi Adam Cutler suggested that three questions when deciding whether to speak or whether to remain silent. By the way, the Bible says it's time to speak and it's time to be silent, okay? We don't always have to speak up. Don't throw your pearls before swine. Don't argue with a fool or nobody will know the difference. Rabbi Adam Cutler suggested three questions when deciding whether to speak up to remain silent. First of all, you've got to know the Holy Spirit. That's not a question, that's just a comment. I believe his questions are helpful when we insert them into the two greatest commandments. They asked Jesus, what are the greatest commandments? Yeah. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. All the other commandments hinge on these. Everything else hinges on that. If we love God and we love our neighbor and we don't tell them about the truth of the Lord, if we don't warn them of the evils and the iniquity, if we don't, if we don't speak up, are we really loving them? Uh, that's the whole big thing. Here's the questions. One, ask yourself, am I loving God and loving my neighbor if I speak up or if I keep silent? Question two, which course of action would help me to make a difference? Be silent or speak up? Three, and I think this is the one I uh, probably resonate the most with. Which course of action am, or, am I more likely to regret? Those of us who are over 20, 25, there's times we wish we spoke up. There's times we'd wish we'd shut up. But these three questions help. Me. I, I want to love God and love my wife. I want to be obedient to the Lord and I want to love my neighbor. But there's times to speak up and time not to. I, I believe it's important to understand am I loving God and my neighbor if I speak up? Or if I just keep silent. Which course of action would help me to make a difference? And which course of action am I more likely to regret in 20 years? I believe whether we speak up or remain silent, we, may, we must always do it as salt and light. And we must always do it in right and love and righteousness. We must serve him as salt, shining as light, towards and for people, for Jesus not for you and me. Do your good works before man that they may glorify your Father in heaven. When we speak up, make sure we're doing it. So people are pointing towards Jesus. Amen. By the way, bring cows next week because the sauna is hot in here. <laughs> and it, it, is it just because of the humidity and everything else? And by the way, is anybody else sweating? And, and by the way, after service, please don't get too near me. I couldn't find my deodorant at this point. <laughs> oh, man, you can get as close as you want. You're going to be, you're going to regret it. <laughs> Carl, I, come on up. I'm going to pray. Father, I pray that, Lord, we as a people understand that you called us. You said we are the salt and we are the light. You in us, Lord. You called us to be influencers. So, Father, I pray that, Lord, we're obedient to your word. We're not hung up, scared, intimidated. But we're not braggadocious. We're led by the Spirit. Help us, Lord, because I believe it's a time for the church to stand up. This church. It's a time to know to do right. It's a time, Lord, that we must stand against the demonic forces that seek to ruin this next generation. Lord, help us to live lives that give credibility to our gifts. And Lord, I pray that we be, we, we've given the opportunity when they come. Let's use them.
such a honor and a blessing. Truly, truly blessed to be able to share this with you. I am always thankful when it's my turn because I, I love sharing the Lord's word and I, I love the sacrifice. Just the opportunity to share with you guys is awesome. Um, before I get into it, though, just the uh, order of operation. I like to go over this every time. Um, we're going to give a brief word, hopefully brief, and then um, we'll stand and come up, starting at this side of the room, and take the sacraments, and then we turn back to our seats, at which point I'll do the Lord's institution. We'll partake together, um, say the Lord's Prayer, and we'll give a benediction. Just and quick aside, and I'm really glad we don't have an organist because they don't plan to go down But um, I... I say that every time because I don't want anybody here to experience what I experienced when I came back to the church. And this is not to disparage in any way the church. I grew up there. I loved that tradition. And I have met many, many saints who I do love to this day. So I'm not saying anything negative about that. But they don't tell the word of operation. Uh, they expect that you go to confirmation day to obtain you know it, and it's done. They don't have to repeat it every Sunday, or you know, they do it twice a twice a month. Um, but and I went through confirmation. I learned all that stuff, and then at 15, I discovered alcohol, and for the next 25 years, I spent all my time drinking and not going to church. So when I finally got sober and came back to the church, um, in the first communion, I, you know, I went back to the Lutheran church. It's what I knew, and that first communion I went to, I was overwhelmed and intimidated to be fair. I was a little scared. And my mind was totally focused on what do I need to do? What's next? What steps do I do? It was all focused on me and not Jesus Christ. And that's why I say this is how we do it. So you can put that out of your mind. Now I know what to do and now we can focus on what's most important. And so, rabbit trail off. Let's get back into what's most important. <laughs> So, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus. I, okay, another quick one to say, I apologize. But, um, and to be transparent, these past six months have been difficult. And they've been getting more and more difficult as the months have passed. This past month has been the most difficult. My mind has been elsewhere. Um, has been constantly on God, but I have not. It's just it hasn't been on my mind. And this past week, I was like, and I knew this was coming up. I knew I had to be prepared for this, but I wasn't. And this past week, I finally just started thinking, okay, what am I going to say that's going to be different? What can I, you know what? I don't know. I can just do the institution. We can just do the ceremony. We can just enjoy it. That would be sufficient. And so I made up my mind that I can do whatever. You know, that's what I'm doing. And God said, you know, Carl, you can do whatever you want. If you're, you know, you're, you're up there, you make the choice. However, I have this thing that's kind of cool. What do you think? It was like a terabyte down. He just went, boom. Wow. You're right, God. That is really, really cool. I'm not going to stand up here for two hours and give him all that information. Um, he was, no, no, Carl, you do what you want. I just wanted to make sure you had options. I'm going to try to give you the first most version of what God gives me because it is, I think it's good. Um, and I heard, pray your grace that if I don't properly convey this, but I will try. And in a nutshell, what he showed me is that there are levels to this. And the base level, what you do, just what your clear, contextual, literal interpretation of the word itself is sufficient and it is glorious. That alone is enough. And we can just roll with that as Christians and it's perfectly cool. However, God adds glory to glory to glory. There are layers upon layers in the world for every story every analogy. It's just amazing. Now, uh, anybody who knows me knows my particular passion for prophecy. I love it. I can't get enough of it. And a lot of reasons for it. I, I want to know everything. 
books, and prophecy is a great way to try to feel like you know everything. But I love it. And the layers that are apparent in God's Word are most apparent, at least to me, in the prophetic. And it makes sense. You have prophets talking about future events. When those future events occur, it reveals what the prophets are really talking about. So you see those layers chronologically. That's obvious, I think. But God showed me that it's not just in the It's in the book poetry. It's in the history. And like I said, he gave me a few hours I could spend like a few hours going through all the examples he showed me. I'm just thinking about it right now. Um, in the poetry, for example, look at um, Psalms 2, 22, 83. On the surface, by themselves, perfectly wonderful, they can do for a while. Um, in the histories, I, I just look at the in of itself, what it did, its purpose on itself was just perfectly perfect, honestly. And it did it, it, it achieved its purpose and on its own, that is enough. This afternoon, if you have 15, 20 minutes, it's really all the amount of time it takes. Go back and read um, chapters five and six in Deuteronomy, and then read chapters five and six in Matthew. Compare the two. And it is amazing the depths that God reveals in the Sermon on the Mount for what the law ultimately intended. The service was sufficient. The layers below it are just outstanding. Um, and I just want to take the rest of this time, and again, I'm trying, trying to keep this brief, to talk about communion. Um, you know, the Last Supper, when Jesus was in the upper room with the disciples, that they were celebrating the Passover. They, you know, an annual festival, a celebration every year. What was the purpose of the Passover? To celebrate the just amazing miracles that God did in Egypt. The ten plagues. The parting of the Red Sea. The escape from Egypt. All of that beyond comprehension, to be honest. I mean, I read these stories and I can sort of intellectually get it, but to have actually been there, to see how God acted in this world, yeah, I would have an annual celebration for that. Uh, maybe more than one. But God said, no, no, just this one. And you're going to do it this way. And I want you to do it exactly this way. With the lamb, with the unleavened bread, with the bitter herbs, with the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of this pointing to the, the work I did in Egypt to take my people from slavery to freedom and bring them into their promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is wonderful. And for generations, for millennia, it was celebrated as such. And on that surface, absolutely perfect. It is glorious, beyond glory. And then Jesus was born and came into this world and did his ministry and went into the upper room with his apostles and celebrated that meal with his apostles, knowing that it was really all about him glory upon glory. And I, I think, you know, after Pentecost, when Peter led the 6,000 to believe in, God, in Jesus, um, you know, they, they were all Jews. They celebrated the Passover for their entire lives. And I sincerely believe they celebrated the Passover the next year. How many of them, as they're sitting there in that meal, their eyes were suddenly open to go, oh my goodness, what I've been doing my whole life celebrating the escape from Egypt was really about him? Amazing. Am amazing. And I think the same thing applies to what we celebrate now. Um, you know, Jesus altered the Passover slightly, but didn't obliterate it because he wasn't here to um, judge. He was here to fulfill. And the Passover is still celebrated, and rightfully so, by Jews around the world. He took it and just altered it for those who believe in him, who understand the fulfillment of the Passover, to a point, I believe, to something even greater. Now, it, again, on the surface, just like the Passover did celebrating the escape from Egypt, communion on its surface is 
absolutely acceptable and glorious to celebrate Jesus the Christ and what he did for us on the cross, saving us from our sin. Perfectly acceptable. However, I do want to propose that there might be a little bit more there. And Scripture is not wholly clear on this, so it is supposition on my part, and I think that's intentional, to be fair. Much like the Jews didn't recognize the fulfillment until it happened with Jesus, the, um, the fulfillment of um, the Passover, I think the same thing applies to communion. I think when the fulfillment occurs, our eyes will be open and be like, oh my goodness, you did this? This is what we've been celebrating this whole time? Wow. But there are hints, like I said. Um, and the first hint, to be fair, I think really comes to the fact that this is a simple meal. I mean, we're just taking a piece of bread, a sip of wine, and compare that to what the Passover was. I mean, there you had a banquet, and you were for hours sitting around reading scripture, going through the ceremony, and a lot of parts, a lot of pieces to it. And I think that, honestly, I think that was because these parts, these pieces, were pointing to the physical. What Jesus did on the cross was physical in this reality, and therefore you have symbolism that points to a physical act. What we celebrate in the communion is spiritual, not physical. So there's not going to be a lot of elements to it because what we're going to experience will be in the spirit and not in this reality. However, we do have two parts. We have his body and his blood because he will be central to it. He will be present and the focus will be on him and we are reminded by, of that by the bread and by the wine. His body, his blood, his presence in, in that time. Um, and again, hints throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament. I just want to touch really quick on um, what Paul said in Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So what we're celebrating is not the physical. We're celebrating and focusing on the spiritual, on the righteousness, on joy, on peace. I hope you can hold that in mind as we come up to receive the elements. And I'm going to just end with this from the book of Revelation. I'll read the scripture first, and I'll just explain what I see here. Uh, this is from chapter 19, beginning in verse 6. Um, no, I'm going to back up to verse 5. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and the sound of mighty thunder, thundering, saying, Alleluia, for our, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Jesus, Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The marriage supper of the Lamb. I believe that's what Jesus is pointing us toward. This glorious, awesome, magnificent experience we will all partake in. What it's going to be, I don't know. The scripture isn't clear or my eyes are blind to it. What I can say, absolutely, is it's going to be magnificent. And I can say that from this scripture. What was John's immediate reaction after witnessing this spectacle? He couldn't help himself. He had to fall down and worship something. It's a worship. Alleluia. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, you are holy. The angel recognized his impulse, said, no, no, not me, Jesus, that you are correct to worship because what this is is beyond anything God has done to this present point. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, 
and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Now let's pray the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. 